Now is the time that we have the great honor to introduce to you our luncheon keynote, Ms. Deborah Moritz. Deborah Moritz is the U.S. Head of Business Consulting for Cushman & Wakefield, based in Chicago, Illinois. <clears throat> Ms. Moritz reports directly to the company's CEO of the Americas and oversees an integrated delivery platform designed to improve client business performance by reducing costs, increasing revenues, and mitigating risk. With more than 25 years of experience and a successful track record of advising business clients on strategic management of their assets and portfolios, Ms. Moritz has developed an in-depth understanding of the complex and unique challenges businesses face to ensure that major real estate decisions are aligned with and support core business objectives. Throughout her career, she has represented many Fortune 1000 clients in business transformations, portfolio analysis, workplace solutions, and asset repositioning. Her work has resulted in meaningful value and industry recognition. Her work has resulted in meaningful value and industry recognition. <clears throat> she originated the concept of workplace solutions within the real estate industry and has published many articles high highlighting the evolving trends. Currently, her team is well recognized for their work, product, and results in operating platform analysis, labor and site location, asset repositioning, business incentives, and workplace solutions for office, industrial, and retail clients. Ms. Moritz holds an MBA in finance from DePaul University and is a proud graduate of Creighton University with a bachelor's degree in finance. She recently completed her master's study in healthcare management at Northwestern University. She was also selected, selected for NSAID's Executive Development Program in France and has continued business and healthcare studies at the University of Chicago and Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management throughout her career. Well, now, without further ado, please help me welcome Ms. Deborah Moritz. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. I think I should have streamlined my bio. <laughs> Thank you for enduring that long explanation of what I do for a living. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I have the privilege of coming back on a fairly regular basis because my brother-in-law, who is sitting in the room somewhere, and I'm sure he won't raise his hand. Oh, there he is. Um, I, I have the privilege of visiting him on a regular basis. So I'm a huge Creighton fan, a huge Omaha fan, and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, let me start by saying um, one of the great classes that I took at Creighton University just a few short years ago was speech. And in speech class, how many of you have taken speech? Everybody? They tell you to start with something startling, something interesting, something provocative, something that would really get the audience to pay attention to you and like you. And I thought, well, with such a diverse group of people, what am I gonna say? What am I gonna do? What is gonna resonate with every single person in the room? And this is what I came up with. <laughs> Doug McDermott becomes a bull. What's not to love about that, right? So thank you to Creighton University for training such a talented athlete. Thank you to the McDermott family for supporting him in his, in his efforts. And thank you to the Chicago Bulls for having the common sense to bring him to my own backyard so I can go see him win games on a regular basis. Now, some of you are probably saying, so what does this have to do with the subject matter? And arguably, you could say very little. On the other hand, you could say there were three key ingredients that are really responsible for helping him be so wildly successful so far and into the future. One is that we as business professionals have to have skills. If we don't have skills, we're not gonna get jobs, and arguably that's one of the biggest challenges in the United States today, is the mismatch between the skills that we have and the jobs that are available. The second thing is clearly his commitment to hard work. I always called myself an A minus student that did well in life because I was willing to bust my butt. There is no substitute for practice, 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 and I think Doug exhibits that very effectively. The third thing is you have to work well with others. Life and business is all about getting things done in partnership with other people. 
Interestingly enough, the government did a survey a couple of years ago and have figured out that 75% of the work product that we create today is done through collaborative, collaborative means. And they anticipate that that will continue to grow in the foreseeable future. So if you can't play well with others, you're gonna be challenged in the future. So for the next few minutes, I'm gonna share a little bit about me and my industry and what I do for a living and then segue on to some advice and counsel that I have based on my experience for primarily the college students in the room. Um, if I'm successful in this dialogue, I'll do two things. You'll have a better understanding for this big, diverse industry that I work in, commercial real estate. And number two, for those of you who are owners, occupiers, investors of real estate, you'll have a better appreciation for why real estate is a very strategic asset that needs to be proactively managed. Okay? Everybody game for the ride? Excellent. So I have an awesome job. I have two important responsibilities. One is I make everybody's life better every single day. And number two, I help CEOs sleep better at night. Sounds fun, right? I hear a chuckle, they're like, yeah, sure, sh sure she does. <laughs> um, sorry, here we go. So let me talk about each of those. So what do I do to make your life better? I, in partnership with my colleagues at Cushman and Wakefield and my partners at the Lund Companies, they're here somewhere, um, do spend every minute of every day thinking about how we can provide an improved skyline across the United States and across the globe and really help the owners and occupiers of facilities manage them better. So think about this. For nearly a century, Cushman and Wakefield has helped transform the country and the way the Americans work, shop, and live. From Willis Tower, or for those of you who are traditionalists and know Chicago well, from the Sears Tower, uh, to the United Nations Building, to the brand new One World Trade Center in New York, uh, to Arco Plaza in Los Angeles, to John Hancock Center in Boston, to Salesforce uh, Tower in San Francisco. I put that in there for my friend Kelly. Um, to Midtown Crossing in Omaha, we help shape skylines all across the country. Inside the offices of major pharmaceutical companies, insurance companies, banks, um, hospitals, um, and energy sector clients, we help them drive business value by transacting, financing, building, advising, appraising, and managing their assets. So again, our industry is pretty wide and pretty deep. Do we have any shoppers in the room? I heard a woo, I like that. That was my niece, I'm sure it was. Um, every day on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, Newberry Street in Boston, um, Ocean Drive in Miami, Regency Court Mall in Omaha, and all along the nation's avenues and streets, people shop in buildings that we have helped sell, lease, construct, and manage. So we touch a lot of people in a lot of different ways every single day. I thought it was important to give a little bit of context because I got my undergrad here in finance. And as a finance major, I anticipated that I was going to go into the banking industry. Um, I, through reciprocity and a fabulous, fabulous um, team in the Career Counseling Center, they knew I wanted to move to Chicago and through reciprocity they gave my, res or my resume to Loyola University in Chicago, unbeknownst to me. And as a result, I got called by a major real estate company. I went and interviewed for the job and I found the job very interesting. That was 25 years ago. I mention this story for two reasons. Number one, career counselors are smart. Leverage them, they take good care of you. The other reason I mention it is I really want the dean to think about adding real estate curriculum to the school. Isn't that a brilliant idea? Wouldn't you guys like that? 
Um, so I'm going to spend a little time talking about just one part of the commercial real estate industry. So again, it's a vast industry. So to do it justice in a 45-minute discussion is going to be really hard. Um, so I tend to think of it segmented into two different groups. The occupiers, the people who use the real estate assets, again, could be industrial, could be manufacturing, could be office. And all of us touch that part of the arena, right? And then there are the investors in real estate. Um, and at the end of the day, the investors are really looking for a return. But that return only occurs if, in fact, the occupancy or the use is well managed. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the occupier side of the business, thinking that it's something that each of you in the room can will resonate. Um, I did want to mention that I prefer not to stand up here and talk for 45 minutes. I really like dialogue. So there are microphones somewhere in the room, right? Um, and if you have questions at any point in time in the discussion, please raise your hand, um, and hopefully they'll bring a microphone to you. But I think this will be more interesting if, in fact, there is some discussion along the way, OK? Plus, it'll help you guys stay awake after lunch. Um, so I mentioned my second role is helping CEOs sleep better at night. So if you're going to help somebody sleep better at night, you have to understand what their top concerns are, right? So the conference board does an annual survey of 1,300 global CEOs, and they ask them to rate their level of concern against 52 key initiatives. And hopefully everybody in the room can see on the board the top 10 concerns of CEOs. These are 2013 numbers, 2014 numbers did come out. There was minor modification, but generally the themes are exactly the same between the two. What's interesting about 2013 is for the first time ever, the number one concern of CEOs around the globe was um, human capital management. So the year before, they were very concerned about keeping and retaining top talent only top talent. Today, they recognize the pending shortfall in the labor supply. Yes, this will work to your advantage. Um, and recognize that if they're going to succeed as an organization, they have to be very thoughtful about attracting and retaining all talent. The second area that they focused on was operational excellence. And again, the fascinating thing about this is in 20, 2012, it was cost savings. So a very positive indicator that the marketplace was getting better. Yes, we care about cost savings, but more importantly, we care about optimized cost, which is the equivalent of operational excellence. How do I drive productivity in my business? The third area of concern was all about innovation. And just as a fun sidebar, for the Chinese companies, this was actually their number one concern, as Chinese companies try to move from copier economies to creator economies and companies. Um, so for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about how real estate can, in fact, and does have a direct impact on those top three areas. But before I do so, I want you to notice and look at the others. And the fascinating thing is eight out of the 10 top 10 concerns actually can, in fact, be addressed through real estate solutions. OK? Everybody with me? I haven't seen anybody nod off yet. That's good. Um, so human capital management. So basically, CEOs are witnessing this tsunami of challenges with human capital. One is we don't have enough people coming into the workforce as the baby boomers work their way out of the system. We're not having enough people come in. The second challenge for some employers is we're targeting a different type of workforce. So millennials, we love millennials, um, is this generation has been raised in a technology-rich environment. And for those of us who have been around a while, we're still managing in a more traditional model. So employers are trying to figure out how to be more applicable, more interesting, more attractive to this younger generation. And then the third piece, which we're experiencing already, is the skills mismatch. So I'm going to touch on each very quickly. So, if you look at the impending chronic shortage of qualified laborers, um, basically employers are saying we have to change our business models 
revamp our locations, and really think more thoughtfully about how we work within our host communities. Um, the problem statement is baby boomers are the first generation to literally not have enough children to backfill their own jobs, right? So all 75 million baby boomers will be 55 or over in the next few years. So we've got this pending shortfall. What's interesting and what's great for all the students in the room, assuming you have the right skills, um, is that this shifts the hiring relationship from employer to employee. So younger talent is basically deciding where they want to live before they decide what company they want to work for. And the other interesting thing is I think we'll start to see employers, governors, and tax incentives will no longer be the primary driver of where companies are heading. So part of the, one of the disciplines that works for me is our tax incentives group. And there are a lot of companies moving to Texas. So before I tell this joke, I just have to see, are there any Texans in the room? Oh, never mind then. <laughs> so we move a lot of people to Texas, and the primary driver is tax incentives, right? Um, but I would suggest that maybe, as the economy continues to evolve and as students graduate and decide where they want to live, maybe the tax incentives won't be the drivers. The students will basically say, where can I go to get a culturally rich environment? And I'm not sure that's in Texas. <laughs> Sorry, he's going to throw something at me later. Um, I'm trying to be provocative. Does that help? Um, so basically, we've got a zero-sum game that we're, we're dealing with. If you take that same concept and look at it from a very different lens, um, census data, and you guys all know the pluses and minuses of census data, right? It's only good every 10 years or so. But look at the problem. So we've seen th this chart reflects the net new additions of workers across the United States. And in 2010, you had net new workers of 1.5 million. In 2015, that dropped to 600,000. In 2020, that's expected to drop to 300,000. So basically, between 2010 and 2020, you're looking at one-fifth of the number. That's a big problem, right? Um, so this is a challenge for employers and potentially an opportunity for, for students. Now, the fascinating thing is you'll see that on this chart, we never catch up with the same numbers. So we have to do a lot more creatively. I looked at the same numbers, just focusing on New, New York, New Jersey, Long Island. Um, because you can look at the states as a whole, but as you really move into micro markets, it tells a very different story. So look at New York, uh, New Jersey, Long Island. Anybody from that area here? Nobody? No, oh, one? <laughs> um, so we're expecting a real problem there, a net reduction in the number of employees that exist there. And as a result, companies are getting smarter about saying, let's mitigate this challenge with labor and be thoughtful about how we can bifurcate our operations and move to different markets. I've had the privilege of working with companies like MetLife, who were very concentrated in this region. And by looking at the labor and where the labor and centers of excellence could in fact be established, we moved all their finance people to Charlotte. I know my, my morning speaker was all about Charlotte. Um, and then we moved their uh, IT function to Raleigh. So diversified labor, but more importantly, built the, a sustainable platform for them to continue to grow in the future. Now, a lot of you are saying, who cares about New York, New Jersey? Look at Omaha specifically. It tells a very different story. So the good news is you never see the same reduction. The good news is that it's a fairly consistent, steady state. The bad news is that you have a pretty limited labor pool, right? So I think it was Forbes or Fortune, I think Forbes, who came out with the best states for business just in the last couple of months. 
And uh, Omaha, the Omaha region was, came out, or I should say it was states. Nebraska was number six. So that's great, right? But if you look at the key components that comprise that overall score, there are five different categories. And one of them is the supply of labor. And um, Nebraska came in number 26. So I think it's up to the, the city and the regional government to really be thoughtful about what else can we do to draw more people to this area. And I know Union Pacific's done some great things, Mutual Vomaho has done some great things, so thank you for that. You guys are very strategic and smart. Um, so the, the other thing that I mentioned was this whole skills mismatch. So, um, two thirds, so, so this is a survey that was done by SHRM. It's a very consistent survey that's been done by Manpower. So all these organizations help with human resource management. Two thirds of all organizations surveyed, and their survey was 10,000 organizations, indicated that they're having a difficult time recruiting people into specific jobs. And so it was 66% this year, it was 52% the year before. So just in one year, they've seen a 14% increase in this challenge and this opportunity. And for those of you who are uh, honing your skills, they looked at soft skills as well, and they said we need to be thoughtful about training people to have critical problem-solving skills. 53% uh, of the companies said that they had a hard time filling those sorts of requirements. And the other one that I found interesting and alarming is that 46% said they were having problems hiring people with the right work ethic. Now I know for anybody who graduates from Creighton, that is not a problem, but it is kind of an alarming statistic. No questions yet? Everybody still awake? All right. So focusing on those stats, it kind of talks about how employers are going to have a challenge. But I'm very passionate about the most important thing you can do is engage your employees that you already have. So it's very expensive to lose employees and then replace, train and replace employees. So Gallup, I think we have a table from Gallup here, fabulous organization. Um, has been very thoughtful in defining what an engaged employee is. And you can see on the left-hand column here the key ingredients to success. Networking, rewards, and oh, by the way, rewards aren't necessarily all financial. Um, providing uh, employees with the right work environment. Culturally conveying an appropriate message through the values. Um, as a matter of fact, I was doing work with an energy company two years ago in Charlotte, and um, they were trying to revise their culture, but they had extended job offers to 15 recent grads, and not a single grad took the job offer. So the corporate real estate lead went home and talked to his son, who had, it was about to graduate the following year, and said, what's up with this? And the son said, culturally, what you're trying to convey is not effectively displayed through the way your real estate, literally, is, is uh, supporting that message. So being thoughtful about what that can and should look like. So the call to action for employers, or people who have their own company, really, um, is to say, what does my composition of employees look like today? More importantly, what will it look like in the future? Um, I work with AT&T, 40% of their workforce is retirement eligible. That is a problem. Um, I work with a company called Entergy. They expect their turnover rates for those with one to three years of experience to continue to increase, so they're targeting solutions for that. I work with Allstate, who says I'm really having a hard time hiring actuarial talent, so putting programs in place to really help that. Um, and it's through these sorts of thoughtful diagnostics and solutioning um, that companies will succeed. So the next area, sorry about that. Thank you. Somebody in the back's helping me, thank you. Um, the next area that the CEOs were concerned about was operational excellence. So again, I define that as productivity, but the CEOs that were surveyed put it in four different categories, cost savings, productivity, strategy. So these CEOs were saying, yes, I have a strategy for my company, 
but the people that sit underneath me have not effectively developed strategies for their respective components of the business. So do I have an IT strategy? Do I have an HR strategy? Do I have a real estate strategy? So they viewed that as a huge opportunity. And the last area was all about value coming through integration. So putting the component pieces together in a very different way than you had historically. So let me talk about that for a minute. So productivity. Um, why do CEOs care about productivity? In the 70s, in the US alone, a growing labor force generated 80 cents on every dollar in GDP gain. 2010 to 2020, due to the low birth rates that we talked about a minute ago and the aging population, labor force gains will contribute only 30 cents of every dollar. And in order to maintain a GDP growth rate of 2 to 3% per year, productivity gains have to come through people working harder, people working smarter, us getting things done through technology solutions. Does that make sense? And if you think it's bad in the United States, go to Europe. They have a much bigger challenge than we do. So let's look at productivity. What is productivity? To me, there's a numerator and a denominator. And again, real estate, real estate solutions can help drive success and return on investment for organizations. If you look first at the top line, how do we enhance output? Obviously being access or convenient to the top talent, Understanding access to our customers. I had done work with a McDonald's organization a few years ago, and in their regional offices, they were really trying to bring in new franchisees and um, new vendor relationships. We were actually able to relocate their real estate, reduce their real estate in size, and completely revamp the interior of their solution to really make it a very customer-friendly um, experience. Through that exercise alone, they were able to see a two percentage point increase in their sales in one single year. We look a lot at how do we increase collaboration. I just finished an assignment with AbbVie, a Fortune 50 company, which is a spinoff of Abbott Labs. And through collaboration, we put together, working with the chief innovation officer, we really reconstituted how the teams work. Can your teams work differently to contribute more increased, um, speed, uh, reduced speed to market and or um, come up with a much more thoughtful collaborative solution to drive new products and innovation? The other area that most people think about, recognizing that real estate for most organizations is the second largest expense item after human capital, um, is they tend to focus on the bottom. They say, what can I do to drive expense reduction? And again, real estate can, in fact, be a strategic asset if, if uh, managed appropriately. So I put this slide in here just to show you guys that um, sometimes what you learn in school is, in fact, used later on in life in the real world. Um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, everybody learned about that, right? Um, and I think the challenge and the opportunity for organizations today is not just to think about how do I improve the client experience, but how do I really engage my employees in a very different way and improve their experience as well. So I said, well, what's a good framework to really help you think through that? And I think this kind of tells a nice story. Now, for years, when we were a little less concerned about um, finding talent because it was overly abundant, um, we kind of took for granted the physiological requirements and we took for granted in the United States anyway the safety concerns. Um, but all of those are actually coming up and becoming more in vogue. So everybody always likes to talk about Google. The CEO of Google didn't feel as though the air quality in his office buildings was adequate. So he developed an app and he literally walks around the office and, and checks the air quality. So we as employers need to be thoughtful about what's meaningful to our employees and the younger generation, thank you, cares a lot about the environment. So um, really retooling what we're doing and how we're doing it. Safety and security. Um, clearly when we're doing work in Bogota, this is a huge challenge, but just last week I was in Philadelphia with a major Fortune 500 company who's considering relocating. And his number one, the CEO's number one concern is the fact that they're in an environment that's a little bit on the edge of the city and one bad incident occurs 
and that would destroy not only the reputation of the organization, but equally as important, the financial performance. The fun part gets to really thinking about how do we help you as individual employees with attraction and belonging and self-esteem. So yes, real estate is only one part of the solution, but we can enable and reinforce a company culture, collaboration, and teaming and creativity. Pretty soon I'm gonna call on somebody. The third area, so I talked about how the CEOs say, I need you to develop a strategy for me. Um, industry nor, um, information and surveys say that actually only 30% of the, the, again, the Fortune 1000 companies truly have strategies in place to help support their business. So that's an alarming statistic. To me, strategy comes in five different buckets, and I didn't really learn about strategy until um, my master's program, so hopefully strategy is one of the classes that's taught in the, the school now. But so for those of you who haven't had that class, I tend to think of it in five different buckets. So arenas, what arena am I going to play in? Working with Whirlpool by knowing in, in advance that they were repositioning their business, we could do a sale leaseback financing as an exit strategy for a manufacturing plant, which put them in a much better position from a community relations perspective, because leaving an owned facility is very different than leaving, leaving a leased facility. Um, you look at the vehicles, how do I achieve my cultural refinement? So ITW, a Fortune 50 company, has decided that they were literally going to take their 150 different subsidiaries and start to really manage them in a more cohesive way. So by doing that, you can enable that success through real estate. Um, how do we win? Um, I talked a little bit earlier about MetLife and how they chose to win through their labor talents. Um, Union Pacific, fabulous organization. Uh, I was there, I had the privilege of working for Union Pacific early on in my career. Fabulous organization, fabulous job. Um, and at that particular point in time, they recognized that they had a lot of underutilized assets. So they said, well, let's do something about that, and they started a development group. So through that responsibility, we were, we were looking at driving value for the bottom line performance of the organization. And although it was wildly successful in the short term, that funny thing called the economy got in the way, and uh, development became a little bit more challenging. The last piece is staging. So how am I gonna stage my strategy in order to achieve my objectives? And for those of you in healthcare management, we see a lot of companies now saying, or um, healthcare uh, organizations saying, I fundamentally have to reposition myself uh, to support ambulatory care, right? And that's largely a retail model. So understanding where the demographics are in order to capture that ideal um, client is really important. And we've actually had some of our clients say, I want you to get that retail spot before our biggest competitor. Um, I don't recommend that strategy, but that was part of their strategy, thinking about staging and staging appropriately. Still no questions? Everybody awake? Okay, okay. Um, and then lastly, getting things done differently. My favorite quote, Einstein's definition of insanity. Anybody know it? Doing the same thing the same way you've always done it and expecting different results. Well, that's not permissible anymore. So in my world, really taking risk, HR, IT, finance, and really mixing the pot in a very different way. So we're no longer submitting individual business cases for solutions. We're really merging the whole pot to come up with a very thoughtful, integrated value prop that can move the needle to the C-suite. Okay? So the third area, innovation. Um, innovation means a lot of different things to a lot of people, but the primary driver um, in my mind is really more about getting things done through collaborative efforts. So that's a little bit of a stretch maybe, <laughs> um, but I think it's, it's valuable. 
So the corporate executive board interviewed 10,000 different companies, so a pretty good sample set, and they said, does workplace make a difference in driving innovation? And they looked at a number of different indices, but two I wanted to share with you today. The collaboration indices. The number one response for how I can improve collaboration was really all about the workplace environment with 19% of the companies highlighting that as the, the number one answer. Um, but in addition to that, we looked at the innovation index. How do you drive innovation? And the number one concern, or the number one area was really all about managerial talent. So can the manager drive results? But real estate was the number two area of focus. In addition to that, we talk about place has a purpose, and a lot of things we take for granted. So do you, any of you remember the Allen curve? And no surprise that if you look at distance and communication, the farther away you are, the more you see a negative correlation, right? Um, in the 70s, they did this study and talked about you're four times as likely to communicate regularly with somebody sitting uh, six feet away from you than with someone sitting 60 feet away. And you'll see, hopefully you can see both of those lines there, they did the study again after email uh, became vogue, and there was really no difference in the storyline. So what does this mean? This means proximity and convenience uh, to others is very important. So you're seeing a lot of companies design buildings with much larger floor plates because the thought process is if you have to go between floors, that interaction will not occur. You see a lot of other companies really looking for that spontaneous interaction. Um, my favorite story in this arena was really Steve Jobs who when he was designing his big uh, mothership headquarters really wanted one set of restrooms, thinking that everybody would come to the center core and you'd naturally run into people. Uh, no surprise, uh, the uh, building code wasn't uh, supportive of that, but again, it gives you something to think about. So every day in the location, the facility, the space envelope itself, and then what happens in the space envelope can in fact drive success or uh, defer success. The one last thing I wanted to mention th in this particular uh, subject is even the furniture system has an influence on the way you guys work. So a real life project, two project teams, same company, same leader types, same types of individuals comprise the teams. The only difference between the two teams was one group sat in cubicles, the other group sat in open space. And it was fascinating to see the results. So project team A, they still seem to manage and work within silos, not really cross-pollinating. And if you looked at the communication channels, they were long, they were cumbersome, and they had multiple steps. Compare and contrast with project team B that was in this open environment, non-dedicated space, they really improved their cross-pollinization of cross-functional teams and messaging, and they were dramatically able to reduce their ability to communicate between colleagues. Same company, very different results. So hopefully that gives you one more thing to think about. So those are the top three areas, and by design, I'm not spending a lot of time with others, but real estate, commercial real estate, can in fact drive improved customer relationships, can help manage and mitigate risk, can help with global expansion, can in fact be a reinforcement or a complement to your brand and your reputation, and equally as important, can drive sustainability in your organization. So typically when we talk to CEOs, we say there are a lot of things that you should think about and hopefully I've done an okay job describing that real estate is an important asset and should be a strategic asset. Unfortunately, a lot of companies view it as a cost of doing business. Um, my favorite story is Accenture. This is a 10 year old story. So any of you who work at Accenture or have friends at Accenture, this is an old story. So don't call anybody and say somebody was slamming you. <laughs> um, but 10 years ago, I was working with them. At that particular point in time, the CEO, or I'm sorry, the CFO 
was very interested in reducing their costs. So he decided that um, we should pull away everybody's non-dedicated space. So nobody had an office anymore, nobody had a cube anymore, it was all gonna be drop-in facilities. Um, there was a publication at the time called Consultant News, and in Consultant News, the top 25 organizations were able to rank, employees could rank their own firm against their satisfaction at being at that firm. So from one year, they were ranked number two, the very following year, after they had pulled the real estate assets away, they moved to number 24. A huge difference. So don't view real estate as a cost, view real estate as a strategic asset. I spend a lot of time writing strategies, rolling out strategies, implementing strategies for companies. And best-in-class organizations have meaningful, thoughtful strategies with real, live, integrated metrics. Good strategies need to be developed. Equally as important, we, recognize, we need to recognize that as the business environment changes, those strategies, too, will have to evolve. Um, we, we help companies be very thoughtful about the innovation, so I mentioned before, AbbVie, very different firm since they've spun off from Abbott. So that strategy had to evolve in order to help them be the first to market with their, their products. Um, so think about this as a strategy for your business. And my favorite is challenge um, traditional assumptions. You can't get things done by doing things the same way you've always done them in the, in the past. So really being thoughtful about the problem statement, the opportunity statement, and exploring new opportunities for change. So that's how we help CEOs sleep better at night. Now, I wanted to talk about my learnings, my observations, my ideas that hopefully might resonate with the students in the room and anybody who's trying to progress in their, um, their careers. So I just have uh, a few samples of um, how I succeeded in business and what I believe, what I know for sure. I always like to talk about leveraging the whole brain. So is anybody familiar with Daniel Pink? He's written a lot of books on the whole new mind, and basically, you know, my degrees are all left brain degrees. He believes the future belongs to the right brain people, those that are very creative. I happen to think that the future belongs to those who can exercise and leverage both sides of the brain. Um, call it a great mind must be ambidextrous, a great mind must be androgynous, pick your word. <laughs> Um, but the fact of the matter is the world is changing very rapidly. So being able to think on your feet and recognizing that a lot of the careers and the jobs that are going to be uh, available 10 years from now actually don't even exist today. I'm doing my own personal experiment on this. Uh, my daughter is a senior at University of Colorado Boulder, clearly a lesser quality school than Creighton. We've got, um, a, we've got a quick question um, from the back of the room. Sorry about that. Oh, sure. I had a quick question. Um, I moved my business out of California to Washington State for tax reasons, basically. Um, I don't have a lot of human capital, so I wasn't worried about employees following, and I knew a lot of employees would be up in Washington State. I guess my question is, um, do you work with companies and or governments in saying, you know, you've got a great tax incentive here, but you need something for the people that are going to work here. I move into Texas. Now, I love Austin, so I, I would consider Austin because it's a fun place and people would like to live there. But do you work with lo local governments and say, yeah, it's a great tax thing going on here, but nobody wants to be here, and f especially for companies with human capital? And uh, so I, just, I was just wondering if, if you get involved with that as well. Yes. Thank you for asking a question. Yes, we spend time um, with companies, and quite honestly, I don't support somebody moving purely for a tax advantage. Um, it should be a holistic business decision, right? Um, we have helped communities um, in really coming up with a unified strategy for better attracting people and companies to their, their um, organization. Charlotte, 
Duke Energy, um, Bank of America, all unified in a very meaningful way to tell a much more compelling story to get a, uh, attract and retain talent in the Charlotte uh, marketplace. And again, I see a lot of great things that you're doing in Omaha here. Um, so don't make the decision based on taxes and if municipalities or energy companies and or states are thinking that they're gonna just be able to attract talent because of the tax advantage, I think it's a very short-term benefit. Um, I did have one other question. <laughs> yes? Um, I see the ads on TV, especially when you're going to New York, New Jersey, for New York giving you a 10-year tax break to go there. Yes. Does that work? <laughs> Great question. Um, for a lot of organizations, yes, it does. Um, so New York, New Jersey especially, um, what, what I've seen in New Jersey that I like is that through their Grow New Jersey initiative, they're being very thoughtful about viewing it as an opportunity, not just to attract talent, but to really revive key areas in their state. So in order to achieve maximum benefit, that company coming in or that company investing capital really has to invest in key specific areas. So it can't be anywhere within the state. Um, so yes, they're getting smarter, um, and yes, it will continue to be a real live advantage for companies, but it will be those that have the cultural benefit in alignment with the talent, in alignment with the tax incentives that are really gonna win, okay? So thank you for those questions. So back to my uh, daughter that goes to that lesser quality school. Um, so she'll graduate in the spring with two degrees, one in integrated physiology, which is all about chemistry, uh, physics, biology, and anatomy, so clearly a left brain discipline, and a degree in advertising, clearly a right brain. Now, I mentioned this to somebody last night, and they laughed, and they're like, I don't get it. And I said, well, you know, maybe I don't get it either. But, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is the fact that she can leverage both sides of her brain has really actually led her to some fascinating internships already through her college career. Um, and I would encourage you to invite her here in five years to see if she's really using both sides of the brain and if it's worked to her advantage. But a long-winded way of saying, have the skills, but have the creativity to problem solve, and that's where the future lies. Dare to be different. So I mentioned that I got ahead through a lot of hard work, um, but I would say this was the single most important thing I did in advancing my career. Um, so there were lots of steps along the way, but probably the most significant was when I worked with an organization, my company acquired a larger organization, and the mothership happened to be in Chicago right in my own backyard. At that time, they asked me to come lead a transaction team, and I knew myself well enough to know that that probably wasn't going to make me jump out of bed every morning and be excited. So I went to them and I asked if I could start a consulting practice. They had no vision for it. They had not thought about it. Um, it was at a time of change, so they were somewhat preoccupied with merger integration. But it was through that discussion and that dialogue that our consulting practice was launched, and within a few years, it was a $30 million business. I got ahead not by blending, but by really being bold and asking a few important questions. Keep learning. I didn't put this in here because I'm presenting to college and university students, um, but this is the most important thing you can do going forward. You can learn in a lot of different ways, whether it's just through reading or um, uh, in my world, every single client is different, every single project is different, um, but be sure to focus on continuous education. Uh, life's more interesting if you continuously learn. You're more interesting, and more importantly, you're of greater value to the organization you serve if you've got that commitment to learning. Um, and lastly, I started the conversation by saying, play well with others. Life is not a, an individual sport. Um, it's all about knowing, recognizing, and seeing what you can do to drive success in partnership with others. And that will only be expanded in the foreseeable future. We sometimes take life a little too seriously. Um, business can be stressful. Business can be hard. 
You can have high maintenance clients, you can have bad days, but at the end of the day, keep everything in perspective. Mother Teresa has a great quote that talks about if you're having a bad day or feeling sorry for yourself, go spend time with someone less fortunate than you, and it makes a big difference. So with that, any questions? A question, yes. You spent a lot of time in this little presentation here talking about how to succeed in business. Do you believe that you as an individual are successful, and how do you measure what success is? <laughs> That's such a great question. I'm, I'm chuckling because that was my son's high school assignment last week. So. <laughs> um, Success, success has to be defined by you as an individual. To me, success is, are you contributing in a meaningful way to society? Plain and simple. And that will be um, in many different ways. So yes, I have my day job, so am I successful here? Sure, by the traditional standards, yes. But more importantly, I'm successful as a parent, I think. I don't know, my brother-in-law can speak up at this point and say she's really not. Um, so am I providing my kids and their friends with the right environment to really grow and prosper and be valuable contributing members to society? Um, and then how am I helping with the community, whether it's through direct religious affiliations and organizations and or other uh, like kind of organizations. So I spend a lot of time with American Cancer Society. Uh, we launched a, um, a religious choir in my community for girls six, uh, six years ago, and the intent was, yes, to help teach them choral skills, but more importantly, give them a commitment to serving the community and really making a difference through that organization. Um, so you better bet every single night I say I'm not doing enough and I have more to give. So from that perspective, am I successful? No. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Uh, from what I've heard, um, you have clients in a very wide range of industries, and I was wondering if you could speak to us a little bit about how you evaluate those companies and um, to see how you can serve their needs better and therefore making them more successful. Um, so how you, how you look at each um, company on an individual level versus as a whole? Great question. Well, part of the reason I love my job is every company is different and has very different challenges, so no two days are ever the same. Um, so I'm very much uh, focused on opportunity, and no, it's not just opportunity for me to sell and introduce solutions. Um, it's really saying every organization is a continuously evolving organization, so can I make a difference in that organization? Um, so typically I will look at the leadership quality, and not necessarily that they have the answers, but they're receptive, they're aware that new ideas and new solutions can in fact be considered, and that they're willing to listen to new ideas and solutions. And the third thing I would say along the same lines is that they recognize that any change is manageable uh, with good change management. So they're not intimidated by trying something new or going down a particular path. So that's what I look at when I look at companies. Thank you. I feel like I'm getting a suntan up here with those nice bright lights. Um, as an individual in this industry, uh, what would be, would you say, the most difficult lesson you had to learn or the one that took kind of the most time for you to really realize? Most difficult lesson I had to learn. Um, for me, Everybody's different. Um, I actually never had a lot of confidence, and it wasn't until I had one particular boss that was smart, but smart enough <laughs> to really care about the employees, all of the employees, not just me, and, and give me a book called Even Eagles Need a Push, saying you've got a ton of talent, and the only thing that's standing in your way is that confidence. Um, you know, I think that, that was a hard lesson not to hear, because I kind of knew it, but it was a very hard lesson to apply. So not everybody is born with confidence, 
people need to learn it, people need to train. Um, and I would still say I'm not the most confident person in the room. I don't know who, who is. The dean. <laughs> um, but, but I think that's been the hardest thing, because you're basically trying to make a, a, almost a complete transformation of your personality so you can really move to the next level of effectiveness. Does that answer your question? Yes. Other questions? There's some way in the back. Um, I was just wondering what advice you would give to your 22-year-old self. Uh, many of us seniors are looking at our our job search for next year, and uh, what advice would you like us to keep in mind as we uh, open that job search and then uh, you know, potentially move away from the Midwest even? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, it's so interesting to me, because in some respects, job search is much easier today, in my opinion, than it was way back when, when we had to type up our resume. I remember buying a typewriter my senior year in college, and it was a really cool typewriter because you could actually type and make mistakes for 10 characters and still go back and correct it. I mean, that was just, woo, that was so cool. Um, you know, so it was a very manual, cumbersome process. You know, seal the letter, throw it in the mail, keep your fingers crossed that somebody would catch it. I am a huge fan of LinkedIn. Love, 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 love LinkedIn. And I'd be thrilled to death if anybody here is on LinkedIn and they wanted to connect with me. That'll be one of my measures for success for today if anybody wants to link in with me. Um, but through that, you know, really networking, really leveraging those relationships. And remember, as you're talking to people, generally people like to help other people. So if you don't hear back from somebody, do not view it as a negative. View it as uh, people are busy, people have other things on their plate. Be appropriately tenacious, um, but really maximize the connections. We're all connected, we all want to help. And don't ask for the job, ask for a conversation. And it's through that conversation at a minimum, you get smarter about what you want to do and how you want to do it. At a maximum, maybe you're actually offered a real live job. Okay? I think there was another question in the back. No? Anything else? Well, I have no idea how I'm doing on time. Am I okay? Yeah, um, yeah another question over here, sorry. Okay. Um, with respect to what you said about human capital management, uh, what is your thought on treating our employees as global citizens rather than uh, individuals uh, representing a specific country or background? Oh, I love that question. I'm intrigued. Can you expand on that a little bit more? Um, sure. With the concept of global citizenship, we believe that there is no border and everyone is equal. So uh, from your perspective as a CEO, uh, uh, what is it, why is it important for talent retention in each company to treat individuals as uh, global citizens rather than uh, specific people with okay. just one background? Yeah, um, great question. So there is no doubt that we're living in a global environment and you're gonna see a lot more cross-pollinization of people from country to country and a lot more um, integration of workers. When I talked about the hierarchy of needs and appealing to people at different levels, the future and the, su the, the successful companies will recognize individual differences. So you're starting to see companies put prayer rooms in their space or siesta rooms in their space, recognizing that we are in fact working in a global world and more and more and more of our employees need to be treated as if they're whole human beings. You know, we've tended to focus in the past on just their work space. Now we really need to be appreciative of the whole being and putting solutions in place to make you feel like we understand who you are and we're enabling your success, not just in the workplace, but in the play space as well. And if you're successful in the play space, we believe that that translates to real live results within the workspace. Okay, thank you. Uh, what's the most important uh, cultural aspect that would attract people um, who wanted to go to a job to a specific city? Does anybody have an opinion on that? I'm thinking I'm in Nebraska. I have to say something about sports, right? <laughs> um, I think it, uh, that's a great question. Um, 
I'm not sure if there's uh, one thing that I believe. There's a lot written about proximity to universities and higher ed is one of the most important draws, seriously, um, because it shows that continuous learning, people have um, access to all the great programs. This is a perfect example that universities usually are pretty good at sponsoring and putting on. Um, when Charlotte did their redevelopment, they focused a lot on museums. Literally within six years, they had five museums open up. Um, again, I'm not sure if that was based on scientific theory, but they believed that the more traffic, the more diversity of cultural enhancements that existed, the better positioned they were for success. So culture comes in a lot of different ways. Attractions, it's really all about the, the person. So I would think about it, who are you trying to hire? What's the composition of the person you're trying to hire? And or in the case of Omaha, what's the person you're trying to attract? And I think clearly you guys have done a great job in diversity of industry. So my guess is the cultural enhancements need to come at a pretty diverse level as well. So museums, sports, higher ed are, are usually the top three areas that are focused on. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. All right, thanks. Other questions? I'm done. I'm officially done. Um, so this is what work looked like when I started. <laughs> Someday I'm going to tell that joke and nobody's going to laugh. They're going to say, really? <laughs> Anyway, you guys have been fabulous. Thank you for uh, inviting me here. I appreciate it. Have a great afternoon.